want for Christmas? Money? A TV? A car? A trip? A new computer? Some clothing? When I was a kid, we would always go through the packages under the tree and squeeze them to figure out what was in it. If it was hard, it was a good chance it was a toy or some train set. But if it was real squishy, we knew it was a shirt or pants or a sweater. And if it was one of those narrow strip boxes, you knew it was a tie. And those are just dead giveaways. Your two front teeth would be nice to have too, I suppose. When I was a boy, Christmas was an exciting and magical time. I would get so excited as Christmas drew near that I could feel it deep down inside my gut. My brother and I had a countdown calendar in our bedrooms. It was a strip of green felt with hat, which had a Christmas tree embroidered on the top and 24 white buttons that were tied up with red, um, red string to it and a bell at the bottom. And we would go through the month of December. Every night before we'd go to bed, we'd untie a button and take it off and know that we were one day closer to Christmas, one day closer to the coming of Santa Claus. And as we took off button after button after button, my brother and I would get more and more excited until finally we take off that 24th button on Christmas Eve night and we'd ring the bell and know that next morning when we got up, Santa would have come. And I can remember my brother waking me up, jumping up and down on my bed at four in the morning. Get up, Greg, get up, Greg. Come and see what Santa had brought. It was exciting. It was so fun. Some years we'd have our grandparents staying with us. My brother and I couldn't help but laughing into our pillows late at night, listening to our granddad out in the den on the second floor of our house, snoring away. <laughs> and it was always frustrating because mom and dad would say, now be quiet now on Christmas morning. You don't want to wake up granddad. My goodness gracious, he was waking us up. <laughs> Santa's been here, ho, ho, ho. The countdown to Christmas, the excitement, the fun, the expectation and the hopes and the dreams. Christmas was a magical time. But as I grew up, some of that magic wore off. It became more of an effort, a chore, an awful lot of work. Shopping for people, decorating the house. I was watching last night National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation and watching as Chevy Chase is trying to put the Christmas lights up on the side of the house, and he staples his sleeve of his shirt to the side of the house. <laughs> I did that once. <laughs> and then he goes sliding off the roof of the house. I did that too. <laughs> Worrying about getting just the right present, as if getting the wrong one would end the world. Frequently, Christmas had become more about stuff than about Jesus. Indeed, so often the good tidings of great joy get lost in the Christmas season. Lost in the presents, lost in the decorations, lost in the parties, lost in the dinners, lost in the special events. The good tidings of great joy aren't even welcome in our secular society anymore. Snowmen are welcome. Christ's children are not. In the midst of our Christmas celebrations, where is the Christ child? This world, my brothers and sisters, needs those good tidings of great joy because we live in a world filled with fear. War, violence in the streets and even in the elementary schools, fiscal cliffs, death and taxes, health in the face of illness and pain and aches, the increasingly difficult task of making both ends of the month meet with the next. 
Opening a letter from the IRS. Ooh. The ever, in, the ever dwindling sum in our checking accounts. Family squabbles. Asking that pretty girl or for some of you that pretty guy out on a date. And by the way, young folk, it doesn't get any easier as you get older. What to buy? The person who already has absolutely everything that you could possibly afford. And when you ask them, what do you want for Christmas? And they say, a new car. And how to care for loved ones who make it so hard to care for them. The world needs the good tidings of great joy. We need the good news. We need that baby. We need the Savior, Christ the Lord. I have a friend who's something of a bah humbugger. He'll say things like, but Greg, Jesus wasn't really born on December the 25th. So? So what? But, but, but December the 25th was the celebration of Saturnalia and the winter solstice, and it was a pagan holiday. So? So what? We're not celebrating those pagan holidays. We're not worshiping Sol Invictus. We're not celebrating the winter solstice. We're celebrating the birth of Jesus. We're not celebrating ho, 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 jingle bells and white Christmases either. We're celebrating the good tidings of great joy. We're celebrating the incarnation of God in human flesh. We're celebrating the birth of a baby who would come to change everything. During the cantata, we sang one of the songs, A Baby Changes Everything. Well, this baby does change everything. Not just for the world, but even more amazingly, for you and for me. I said at the beginning of the message that while I was a child, Christmas was a magical time, but that as I grew older, it lost much of its specialness, such of, much of its magicness. True, it did. But there still are moments when the holiness of this time, this time when the Holy Spirit broke into time and space and overshadowed Mary, and she conceived Jesus in her womb. There are moments when this special time becomes very powerful for me. One day, 13 years ago, I was driving home from Wichita Falls. We just finished our 11 p.m. Christmas Eve worship service at Beverly Drive United Methodist Church. And I was driving home to spend Christmas with my mother and father and my brother and his son. It was bone-chillingly cold. There wasn't a cloud in the night sky. The stars were shining brilliantly. Indeed, you can see the backbone of night, the, the Milky Way, our galaxy stretching across the sky in brilliant, beautiful, incredible relief. At that time, I'd been driving back and forth between Dallas and Wichita Falls every week, several times a week, because I was teaching a class at Perkins School of Theology. And so I had in my trunk my telescope all the time, because I never knew when I'd be on that road at midnight or later, and it would be so dark and so beautiful, and I just couldn't pass up the opportunity to stop for 30 minutes and look at the stars. Well, as I rounded over the hilltop, heading on down past Bowie on that highway, at 1.30 in the morning, I saw that sky, and I heard Julie Andrews on my CD playing, Oh Holy Night, singing it beautifully. And I was struck with the majesty, the beauty of God's creation. So I 
I pulled off the road into a field that I had stopped in many times before, popped the trunk, pulled out the telescope, set it up, and started looking. There I am. It's about 20 degrees. There's not a cloud in the sky. It's cold. I'm in a suit with clerics and an overcoat, looking through a telescope at the beauty of God's creation and realizing that the one who made all that the one who spoke a word, the word, and all that came into being was born, was conceived, and came into this world to be with us and then to die for us. Amen. And I could remember in that moment standing there feeling that that knot in the pit of my stomach that I remembered from my childhood days in excitement at Christmas starting to reappear suddenly in the excitement of realizing that it's not about the presence under a tree. It's about the presence of Jesus in our midst. This Christmas, I encourage all of us to hear the good tidings of great joy, to hear the good news, to hear the proclamation of the birth of Jesus, to have the Holy Spirit overshadow us, and let the Christ child be born again anew in us. I encourage us to turn from the pain and the evil and the hurts of this life and the distractions of this life, to turn to that little baby who would grow up and change everything. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Holy Creator, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the giver of life, love, joy, and peace. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe. Master of all that was and is and is to come, you formed us from the elements of all eternity. Speaking your word of grace, you created us and breathed into us the breath of life, giving us your very image and calling us to a new relationship with each other and with you. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. His coming was foretold by the Hebrew prophets, announced by the archangel Gabriel, and humbly accepted by Mary and Joseph, who submitted themselves to God's calling to share the eternal light of the love of the Christ with the whole world. Our Lord was conceived by faith, accepted by faith, recognized by faith, and proclaimed by faith. Elizabeth and her unborn son, who would become John the Baptist, recognized him while he was still in his mother's womb. Shepherds were drawn to the site of his birth in Bethlehem of Judea, and the heavenly hosts of angels sang of his glory. We join their songs of praise this night, opening our hearts and mouths to proclaim 
He is born. Christ Jesus is born. Our Lord Emmanuel is born in our hearts afresh this night. And we, like Mary and Joseph, are called to share him with a broken and hurting world. Christ is our light, our hope, our joy, and our peace. And in his abiding presence, we experience acceptance, forgiveness, and transformation as we approach your throne of mercy and grace. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of the faith. gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. By Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. If those who are assisting would come forward at this time. Because there is one loaf, we, though we are many, are one body, for we all partake the one loaf. The bread which we break, it is indeed a means of sharing in the body of Christ. And the cup over which we give thanks. It is indeed a means of sharing in the outpoured blood of Christ.
Jesus. 